Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this session. I have quite a diverse group of panelists here. I uh, definitely no, um, definitely not a homogenous group. Uh, I'm all coming from different industries and areas. Um, at this panel, we are going to talk about ethics of ESG, the ethics of ESG. And what we will try to do is to answer the question of how the private sector can contribute to sustainable and inclusive future. My name is Dr. Liesel Grunewald, and I'm the CEO of the Ethics Institute based in South Africa. The ethics of ESG revolve around integrating ethical principles into business practices to promote sustainability and social responsibility, as all of us, of course, know. Some of the key aspects of ESG is, of course, environmental ethics, which uh, involves making decisions that minimize harm to the environment. Then, of course, social ethics. This focuses on the impact of business operations on society. And lastly, governance ethics. This pertains to the ethical management of a company or a business. It involves transparency, accountability, and fairness in corporate governance. And yesterday, especially, we spoke quite a lot about these specific values, as it also pertains to ethical leadership. So the ethical principles, such as honesty, fairness, objectivity, and responsibility underpin ESG efforts, guiding companies to make decisions that are not only profitable, but also socially and environmentally um, responsible. So we have five esteemed panelists here, and um, they are going to answer this question of how the private sector can contribute to a sustainable and inclusive future. I'll start with Dr. Liu Louis Baocheng. Um, you are familiar with him. Um, he is the director of the Center for International Business Ethics at the University of International Business and Economies, uh, Economics. Economics? Yeah. In economics. Eco economics, yeah. economics okay. <laughs> In China. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome, doctor. Uh, Jerome Eschbach. Jerome is the Head of Sustainable Solutions at BNP Paribas. Vincent, uh, Vincent Subilia, Executive Director at the G Geneva Chamber, Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Board Member of the International Chamber of Commerce, Switzerland. Welcome. Prof. Jenny Phillips, at least we have some gender representativity here. Yeah? Uh, Prof. Jenny Phillips, yeah. Dean, Faculty of Business and Law at the University of St. Joseph, Macau, China. And then last but not least, very important man, like everyone else is, but we depend <laughs> quite a lot on him, um, Mr. Andre Schneider, CEO at Geneva Airport. Yes, and board member of Globe Ethics. Thank you. All right, welcome everyone. I'm going to ask um, one round of questions and then a second round of questions and maybe if there is time, um, a little bit more, but there's a very big timer here in front of me. Um, so we'll try to stick to it. And I've also asked the panelists to keep their eye there. Yes. Jenny, I'm starting with you. Okay. Um, the concern for sustainability, especially in, in environmental and social contribution, has gained more attention in Macau this decade. What has the engagement and reactions of SMEs in Macau been? Okay, well, uh, thank you for the question. So uh, I'm from Macau and uh, just uh, when uh, Fadi was telling me about this uh, global ethics and there is this panel about ESG, I was like, okay, it's, uh, I, 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 it happened that I just uh, completed uh, an ongoing part of a research about ESG by small to medium enterprises in Macau. I think uh, everyone here, those who knows about Macau would know that, would know about the casinos, 
the large integrated resorts. So when we talk about ESGs, when we talk about CSR, it's all these large companies that people think they are doing and how much of them are really their true intent that they want to give back or how much is because of government regulation, how much is for PL, we don't know. So we try to find out from the SME perspective. And one thing, the first thing we found out was that they don't know what is ESG. The small companies, when we ask them, they have no idea. So I told my students, our research team, okay, we, they don't need to know what is ESG. We cut it down and asked them about actions and practices that they have done. And what we found out was that many of them, almost all of them, have participated in environmental protection in the area of reducing the use of plastics, not using plastic bags, not using plastic straws. But the reason was because it's government regulation. And in fact, uh, intentionally, they do not agree to that because they think that the cost is higher for them because they need to look for alternative materials for straws, for example. And then they also participated in changing all their machines to energy efficient machines. And so, and we found out the reason behind was also because there is government subsidy. So as we dig deeper, we found out that for small to medium enterprises in Macau, they don't have uh, the concept on environmental or, or governance or, or this type of ethics, but social they might have. So they would participate in uh, hiring people with disability, for example, giving job opportunities to them and also uh, encouraging staff to participate in volunteering work. But the main issue for them deep down is still profit making. Because for them, what they see is the most important thing is to make profit. How am I going? I, I need to worry about paying rent and uh, paying staff, uh, uh, paying employees uh, their salary to make ends meet. That's their main concern. So they don't put in extra effort to think about environment, to think about the society, to think about governance. The companies so far that we have managed to talk with to do the interview, only then they started to realize because apparently we found out, well, we only have uh, seven cases yet. We haven't do a, a wider research yet, but it turns out that they don't, uh, what we lack is education. What they, need to see is the long term you and uh, the long term sustainability that it is going to bring because currently they don't see the need for the environmental societal and governance measure so that is just some general background to share with you thank you very much um one wonders uh, what the impact will be in the casino industry if um, they get the esg practices Right, it will, yeah, something to look forward to, I think. Jerome, um, being in the Chamber of Commerce and Industry, your focus is very much business, obviously. So uh, we talk about a lot about ethics in business, but uh, what about ethics in finance? Uh, uh, yes, <laughs> that's a loaded question. Um, is it a new concern, old concern? Okay, that's okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for the question. Uh, clearly, sustainable finance seems to be the, the new thing, but it's actually not at all because it started a long time ago. It started already 200 years ago with a, a strong religious background, mainly based on the Methodist, uh, Methodist uh, Church in the US, which decided to exclude from their investments, uh, stocks, investments, related mainly to uh, slavery and to, uh, to weapons. Then it evolved and the, the beginning of the last century, beginning of the 20th century, was launched in the US as a um, pioneer fund, which decided to exclude what were considered as uh, sin stocks, so mainly related to uh, gambling, pornography, alcohol, tobacco. So something very close to what is uh, excluded now from uh, responsible funds or ESG funds. Then slowly the topic became more and more political. 
with um, a very high pressure from uh, students uh, on universities in the 60s, 70s, uh, 70s uh, which asked universities to ban investments related to uh, war in Vietnam, so mainly weapons, and related to apartheid in, uh, in South Africa. Um, so we can see that it started with, with very strong uh, religious bias, but uh, evolved politically and uh, addressing the challenges of uh, each period. So it's not uh, surprising that now it also covers environmental concerns, which are very key. And also what is new is that uh, the topic becomes more and more regulated uh, when before it was left to the will of uh, each uh, entity or institution. Thank you. Um, yeah, the regulation one wonder if it becomes over-regulated, where does the ethics of it all go? But that is something that we can discuss uh, if we have time. Andre, uh, you are a champion in the aviation industry and are therefore best positioned to us, inform us about the position of the aviation industry to sustainable practices. Okay, thank you very much <laughs> for inviting me. Let me just do a first check. Who came by plane to this conference? Please uh, lift your hand. Okay, good. <laughs> me too, but uh, for other reasons. I mean, thank you for this remark. Uh, little correction, if someone loses the baggage, it's actually the airline, but uh, let, let's leave that on the side. Huh? Uh, we can at the end have some questions about what didn't go well on your trip, and I might try to answer. Now, wh what do I want to show? I mean, first of all, I'm a head of an airport, so we're actually not selling tickets. We're offering the possibility for a plane to land or take off and hopefully distribute the baggage on time, as we all <laughs> like to see. But nevertheless, uh, we are also confronted with, a, at least in Europe, really raising social pressure to say aviation is really bad. We should not be using it. Now, how do you position yourself in that one? I'm, I'm not selling the tickets. It's not saying that I'm not having to do something because I think we are very strong on thinking about that if you're offering something, it's not just what you sell, but also what people will do with what you offer. And we have a very strong uh, uh, responsibility to help actually pe people understand how to use it. Because another phenomenon, just to share, I mean, we had for years now demonstrations in the street of plenty of people saying we have to stop flying and everything. And guess what? They're all now in line to take the plane. So we are also confronted with a high level of, uh, how you say, incoherence of people. So yes, we have a role to take to help shape the behavior of the people. And, and for me, it's actually beyond ESG. Because at the end of the day, I, I have grown up, I'm old enough and here I'm luckily not one of the eldest ones, so that's already quite, which is not always the case. Nevertheless, I have grown up when flying was absolutely not accessible for people like me. Not possible, much too expensive, you wouldn't do it. Which meant my... Uh, how you say, my surrounding, which I was living in, was something like 50 kilometers around where I lived. And if I was half lucky, I took the summer train to go a little bit through Europe. And I have had the chance to go and travel further. And it's an incredible experience to learn about differences and I think also form a more informed approach to ethical and values questions. So I believe very strongly that we cannot just give up on it and not everyone will take a sailing boat to go to China. At least I'm not sure. So, which means the position has to be, we have to help people understand that there is a cost by using the plane, even if we're not selling the, plane, the ticket. And we also have to help the industry through what we do, but also by enticing industry. Uh, and I will get back to that in a second, to actually go to a path where we will decarbonize flying. And we have actually as an industry a target to be there in 2050, which is actually aligned with the uh, uh, Conference of Paris goals. So, but the difficulty is we are not stopping today flying. So this brings you in very complicated discussions because even my board asks me already, why don't you do not a publicity action saying don't fly anymore? And I have to explain to them, frankly, you politicians, huh, you can pass a law for that. 
but we are only offering the possibility. But we can actually entice that. For example, we're paying a special financial incentive for airlines which come with last generation planes, which is planes which uh, produce 40% less noise, which is another important issue we have to face, and actually consume 15% less kerosene, which means quite the drop in CO2 emissions. And it has allowed us to raise that. So I think we are really in a situation where we want to do the right thing. For 90% or no, even 95% of the impact we are actually not the guys who do it, but we have to try influence. So actually business has to go beyond to just think about what they do themselves. Because that might be actually the easy part, not always, but might be the easy part, but they have to think what people do with whatever they offer as a service, as a product, because that's where it starts to stick. And they have to also go into educating people to understand what are the consequences of what they do. Not saying you should not do it, but actually better understand. And then hopefully, I really say hopefully, do a more informed decision. So that's a little bit uh, where we stand. I'm not sure whether it's ethics or not. It's just about uh, helping all of us getting out of the different crises we are in without pointing the, the finger, which is very often the case. It's the problem of the industry. It's the problem of this and that, which is the safest way not to resolve anything. Thank you. <laughs> okay, electric planes, there is a limit. I mean, you know, electric planes means storing electricity. The only today green way is through batteries. Batteries have a weight. You can reduce the weight, but by reducing the weight, you increase the, the, the power in a battery per square inch, which means it goes from a battery to a bomb. By the way, you have all heard about those uh, cigarettes and so on, which go off. So there's a limit. That means you can fly with smaller planes, shorter distances with electric, and that will come. In Europe, it will be in Sweden for the traffic to the islands around, which are typically 10 to 16 people, northern uh, UK. There might even be some replacements of taxis or of um, uh, helicopters. But on the long distance, we have only two choices currently. It's either going to uh, sustainable aviation fuel, which reduces by 80% the emissions, minimum at the moment, or we go to hydrogen, which comes with a lot, lot of other strings attached, which I won't go into because otherwise we'll need five sessions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for uh, yeah, that information. I was just thinking, uh, Jenny, on your question, what about electric planes? And uh, the first answer was, Andre, that for that you need electricity. Now in uh, South Africa, and um, I'm trying to find my Nigerian friends here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, not 100% sure what the electricity situation in Nigeria is, but in South Africa, that, that flight wouldn't even you know, go from, from one province to the other with the lack of electricity. Moving on swiftly, um, Vincent. How do you see the Geneva Chambers and um, other Chambers of Commerce um, and the industry in general? Uh, what do you see their role in supporting businesses to lead in ESG? And what would be the next key steps? Thank you very much uh, indeed for that highly relevant question. And, and to those who have traveled from far be it by plane with or without luggage or by train, uh, a very warm welcome to uh, Geneva. We're delighted to... Uh, um, have you here in what is often, I guess, uh, uh, rightly so, because I'm, a, I'm an active promoter of uh, uh, the so-called smallest of the large cities, but can be viewed as a capital of global ethics, because ethics is truly uh, the backbone uh, of the trust economy, which we're advocating here in, in, in Geneva. So welcome again, and I'd like to praise the organizers for setting this event uh, uh, here in particular events whom I see on the uh, last uh, row. Well, coming back to your questions, chambers have always acted as uh, the voice of business, and this is exactly what the Geneva Chamber, which is considered one of the oldest and largest uh, institution in, in, in Switzerland, has been doing for roughly 160 years. Uh, we operate on two fronts, a macro perspective. You know, Switzerland is a very active democracy whereby you vote almost every weekend, just uh, exaggerating slightly, but at least every three months. Uh, and therefore, uh, what we do here is bluntly stating advocacy or lobbying, and we help shape policies. And therefore, in that respect, um, the uh, um, 
sustainability playing a key role, especially in an alpine country where 60% of uh, our uh, uh, land is covered by mountains and where we can really uh, feel uh, the glaciers melting. And this is a very, uh, again, uh, uh, very tangible uh, outcome of uh, global, uh, global warming. Sustainability, of course, uh, plays a, a, a key role. And the Chamber, for instance, has been uh, firmly advocating um, legislative reforms such as the Climate Act or the CO2 Act uh, on, on, on the macro front. Plus, the Chamber is, 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 is a marketplace to the benefits of its uh, thousand corporate members. Uh, and there I believe that we have also a role to uh, play uh, very humbly again in terms of uh, education, because this goes back to pedagogy, which is absolutely key. You've mentioned it uh, for uh, Macao. We don't have a lot of as many casinos as you do, but we have we share the, the same needs of making sure that the new generation, which is, by the way, much more aware, if I may say, of its uh, um, forefathers than uh, of, 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 of these concerns, make sure uh, that not only are they uh, fully um, uh, familiar uh, with the challenges, but that they're willing to embark on them. Uh, that's to set, uh, if you wish, the, 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 the scene. Uh, and, and I modestly um, believe that that chamber is not only here in Switzerland, uh, whereby we are uh, private uh, institutions. That's an important factor to stress because uh, since we're not a member of the uh, government, I also have a political hat, and Andre, rest assured that I'll never, ever uh, dare to, uh, uh, again, uh, reduce the activity of the airport. I, I, I know you'll have some electric and hydrogen plane, and we need them, uh, of course, because without the airport, Geneva would not be uh, that capital of governance that we, uh, that we know. But again, the Chamber being a private institution, we have, um, we can fiercely uh, ascertain uh, our initiatives, and we are not bound uh, by uh, any uh, views imposed on us by, by the state. This is not the case in every country. Chambers, for instance, in our uh, big neighboring, uh, uh, big neighboring hexagonal country uh, here in the West, uh, they directly depend upon uh, the authorities at Bercy, and therefore it's harder for them uh, to have another stance than the authorities. But what I'm saying here is that uh, I, I believe that chambers have always been at the forefront uh, of uh, ensuring that uh, business conditions uh, could help companies grow. And this comes to the bottom line of your question. Uh, my uh, firm belief uh, that uh, corporate actors are uh, part of not only the equation, but the solution for uh, more sustainable um, solutions going forward, and hence ethical uh, behaviors. Uh, there's often a, a clear divide that is being pleaded between uh, those uh, in, in, in favor of, of a greener economy uh, and those uh, that are um, uh, fiercefully uh, fighting for more dividends at the end uh, of, of the year. And I believe, naively possibly, uh, but there are plenty of examples and hence benchmarks for companies uh, of um, corporate players that have man managed to uh, consile or reconcile uh, economy and ecology, which, by the way, for those that have learned ancient Greek, have the very same root, echo, which is the maison, the house, burning, by the way. So again, uh, this, is, this is something that we've always been advocating. And the way we operate very pragmatically is that we take entrepreneurs by the hand and we showcase to them what best practices could be that would not only help them reduce uh, their carbon footprint, for instance, uh, but would in fact generate some added value that can be monetized and hence gain uh, more dividends uh, or, or increase their revenues uh, at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I must say, Vincent, that is heartwarming to hear that you take the young entrepreneurs or even older ones and, you know, by the hand and uh, yeah, promote sustainability and, and ESG in general. Thanks, thanks a lot. Uh, Lou, uh, uh, congratulations with your book um, that you spoke about this morning, uh, Chinese Values. And um, from your book, uh, we gathered, uh, well, obviously you pinned down um, Chinese wisdom in the book and the Chinese values. And I, I wonder if, from the Chinese, from the Chinese perspective, um, what would be 
um, what can contribute to the private sector's con uh, contribution to sustainable and inclusive future? Some wisdom, uh, Chinese wisdom from your side, please. Okay. Uh, in the first place, in the book, I try to tear off the hypocrisy veil of the Chinese value, which means I love others better. Human beings always love themselves better than others. You love your husband because he might be a good cook. He might be good looking. He might have a, a wealthy parent. So people have a reason and that's legitimate enough. They, and those who pre preach love at the back of their mind, in most cases, they want others to be generous and they can be more selfish. They, <clears throat> well, second, it, it is not really wrong, but how institutionally we can set up a structure that those who love themselves can gain far better benefit by loving others. So for a society, either governance or management, you have two things to deal with. One is to grow the pizza, the other to divide the pizza, okay? To grow the pizza, you need to motivate people. So I was saying that uh, the restaurants surrounding my campus, they do not have to love our students or faculty. They love the money, period. Because otherwise, if they don't have the right food or service, we don't give them the money. So if you really educate them to love us, and then we will be obliged to pay for a lousy food. So it's a matter of, you know, if you guys read John Royce, so the, you know, the advocating uh, mere love doesn't serve good of the society before you really have a rule setting, a institutional construct. Okay, so simply, okay, then come to the division of the pizza. The one that cuts a pizza with the last one to pick the slice will, will serve the purpose. Instead of, okay, oh, you have a larger pizza, you have a larger pizza. So institutional setting. Then the third one is that a uh, co-balance for there are two sets of CSRs. One CSR is popularly known as corporate social respons responsibility. And the other part of CSR is called citizen social rights. Without customers protecting themselves, getting allied together to bargain either in the form of union for workers, et cetera, you cannot just unilaterally rely on the benevolence or generosity of one party. So that's really the counterbalance. In a Chinese wisdom, that's the yin and the yang. Opposing each other, but working together. The, 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 you, three guys, uh, you guys can reflect the logo of the yin and yang. So with the yin, there is yang, and with the yang, there is yin, and they can coexist together, but the management lies in how to draw the fine line in between. You can distinguish what is yin and what is yang, but you do not draw a very straight line. You can make it very smooth this way. That's the art of management or that's the art of the governance. Mm -hmm. So if you really make it very straight and uh, make, it every, make, make everything equal, actually that's the socialism that has turned out to be a failure in multiple countries. So they focus on division of the wealth instead of growing the wealth. And then they made everybody equal, but everybody equally poor. <laughs> Thank you. So everyone was picking the scum. So therefore, you know, lastly, it's really Chinese Deng Xiaoping said, let a few get rich first, and then people will admire him and then grow the cake. So at the moment, growing the cake or growing the pizza is still taking presence 
over division of the peace. Mm. But even though the, the, there is a uh, disparity, but those who can take the least share can really do better than what they ha had uh, the yesterday. That's also a good progress. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much uh, for that wisdom and um, the comparisons uh, or metaphors that you use. Surely, uh, something that we can take away with us um, for a long time. Jenny, staying on uh, in China. What would okay? You've, you've told us now about the SMEs in Macau. And um, also that they they are um, actually uh, exercising ESG, but because of regulatory uh, requirements. So what would uh, be your policy recommendation uh, for the implementation of a sustainable ESG strategies for SMEs? How would you um, convince them to do it for the right reasons, the ethical reasons, and not because of compliance to rules and regulations? Well, in order to do it from the actual ethical reasons, uh, like uh, we mentioned uh, earlier, Vincent also ma mentioned earlier, we need education, right? They need to see the need. Actually, for example, uh, environmental ethics, it is something that is not being seen right now. They cannot, they may not see a result right now, but they will see a result in the long term if you if they can do that. Some of the SMEs that we have uh, actually uh, two years ago, we have uh, collaborated with other organizations to launch a Daclan Award for Responsible Business, uh, oh. Responsible Enterprises, we call it DARE. And there were a few com SMEs that dare to apply. And the winners, it seems uh, the, the winners, they actually have the re social responsibility at heart. They did that because they, the actions that they do was because of what they believe in. For example, the winner of that company is a human resources uh, company. Uh, they have put a lot of effort into employees' well-being and uh, caring, and also in sourcing the right employees. So these have to come from themselves. I believe it has to be. It has to come from their their heart. And other organization, for instance, they give an example that is very simple to be responsible to the society. You don't have to do a lot. You don't have to give a lot of money. Some uh, organizations, they don't, they don't think we are, it's the large company that should be donating to all these things, not small companies. But the idea is that uh, responsibility is not just about donating the money. There are things that they can do. For example, uh, one organization, they have um, uh, some rooms for um, milk feeding for breastfeeding. They have breastfeeding room for their staff and they open it to the public. I mean, uh, people who are working in that area, they are in one of the main districts. So this is something that they can, without extra costs on them, they can contribute to the society as well. So uh, what we are trying to do, well, very small effort in my university. Uh, I started a sustainable business series, a small project, which we try to bring in these types of examples and uh, trying to conduct research and do talks and trying to uh, educate uh, people about the need for that. It's not just, we are not, it's not, we're not, we don't have, we're not going, we're not being ethical because of ethics. It is something that is more core to the human value. So we are not protecting the environment because we are asked to do it. We have to do it because this, is part of us, right? The, 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 the world belongs to everyone. Everyone has a responsibility to protect it. And this, if we do not, um, like I, I was uh, always telling the younger generation that if you do not uh, conserve water, if you keep dumping, dumping trash into the sea, when you are, when you get to my age, you don't have enough clean water anymore. So this is uh, something that is longer term that we need to. I think it's too. It might not be easy to 
to uh, for the the older generation, the traditional small businesses that we are studying now. It's it's not be not easy to change their mentality. What we can do is to impose regulation and uh, have uh, companies. Maybe we can uh, talk with the the chambers also in Macau. Mm. They they are the ones that understands more. Maybe through them, we can also can learn from Vincent to see how the chambers in Macau can collaborate to and to to do that. Some of the chambers in Macau are actually doing that also okay. to uh, encouraging uh, ESG practices, but it's mostly the international chambers, the British chamber, the French chamber, but the local local associations, their focus are still too much more on the profit making, like uh, Professor Liu was sharing. It might could be a Chinese mentality, mm -hmm. right? If they're still in the mentality that being poor for so long, they need to make money first mm. and then mm. think about other things. But mm. uh, I think we should, what, what we, we are trying to do is to start changing the mentality from the younger generation. Mm. Thank you. And uh, I think you, you weren't here this morning, but uh, Lawrence uh, with his book, uh, Change Makers, also spoke this morning about, you know, making the mentality of making money, making money. And, and I was not... uh, talking with him during oh, lunch also right. about this. Super. Yes. Thank you, Jenny. Um, Jerome, uh, the financial institutions or banks are also extremely highly regulated. And I suppose, well, not suppose, for very good reason. But um, what would you say are the hurdles that the bank could meet with regards to the integration of ethics and sustainability in its business? And how can these hurdles be addressed? Well, the, the, the issue that we have with uh, ethics, it's, it's not an absolute value. It's not that easy to draw the line between what we consider to be good or bad. Sometimes it's obvious, but uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's not. And uh, it very much depends on your cultural background, may depend on your religion, on your personal values, and also on the, on the time. What was accepted maybe 20, 30 years ago is not uh, acceptable anymore uh, today. Let's take a topic such as uh, abortion, for instance. It may be considered as a sin in some places, uh, whether it's com completely acceptable in uh, other places. Same for marriage for all, death penalty. It very depends on the place where you live, on what you believe individually. Um, we also have a very strong debate about uh, weapons. Uh, weapons. Some may consider that uh, weapons are bad and shouldn't be part of uh, investments, responsible investments. Others may think that they are absolutely key to uh, protect uh, democracies, to preserve peace. And uh, more tricky, you may have some topics that may uh, confront environmental and uh, social uh, themes, challenges. If we are talking about uh, the fight against uh, deforestation, uh, this is very good for environment, but may lead also to a job cut in the uh, agriculture sector. And clearly it's not the role of a bank to tell their clients what is good or what is bad, but uh, a financial institution may be bold also and have its own convictions and uh, set very strict guidelines about uh, what they agree to, to finance and or, or not to finance. And also it's very important for business, not only banks, but business more generally to, uh, to rely on uh, some um, international uh, regulation, rules, uh, structures such as uh, the UN Global Compact, which is a very interesting re uh, referential because they state 10 principles related to the um, protection of uh, the respect of human rights, labor rights, protection of environment, protection uh, and uh, of uh, business ethics. And it's very important also that companies, corporates, business can rely on uh, this kind of uh, setup. Thank you. And um, yeah, no, let me <laughs> want to elaborate now on that question, but um, let me first give our other pan pan panelists an opportunity Andre, um, the aviation industry um, does sit with a few challenges, as you've mentioned, in terms of ESG. And um, how does one then balance society's expectations in sustainability, the individual's behavior, and the answers or the approach to the industry? Now, you touched on it a little bit earlier, 
but um, I'm sure that you have some more to say about this. Thank you very much. I, I think, uh, as I said, I mean, and we just heard it now from Jerome, it's, uh, there is never a total clear line. What might be acceptable for one is less acceptable or not acceptable at all. Uh, it's also very clear that an industry is not going, I mean, that's perhaps an important part. We as industry, we don't shape society. And that would be a big mistake. So we also have to be able to rely on the legislators, the society, to also take choices. I mean, you cannot all bounce back. It's not because it's something is available that, uh, or you cannot be forcing uh, an industry not to make something available with some exceptions, arms, for example, but that's another issue. I won't go there. Very personal opinion. But there, there are things, uh, I mean, just take cars. I mean, in Europe and in Switzerland, we want to reduce uh, uh, um, engines which use uh, gasoline. But can you, should you have a law which doesn't allow for it or not? I think that's a question of the legislature. It's not, I mean, as a producer of cars, you have to produce cars which are less and less impactful on the environment and at the best speed possible. So you're not here to just wait and that might be different speeds. So the difficulty we have, and I alluded already a little bit to it, is that when you have uh, political discussions, everyone is the first one to say, we don't want to have aviation and everything, but they totally forget that probably their job is depending on having an airport that, uh, and, and so on. So, and that's very difficult for us as an industry because we are not those who have to say he is right or he's wrong. And, and we have to work on, on, on making our impact on the environment, on, our, on the people around us, less and less important. But we're not going to choose what should be there or not, even if you might have an opinion. And in Switzerland, where you can vote every weekend or every two or three months, we, will, we have plenty of space to express that. So I think the challenge really is, is for the industry is to help people better understand what they can do with the product or mm. the service you offer. Uh, and, and I think that's probably also some path that the financial industry could go, not to choose, I don't do that or not, but I expect this industry, if I want to continue to invest in it, that they take some actions that people who buy whatever they sell is used in a sensible or responsible way. Mm. Mm. Because that's, that's something which is much less used, and I think that's a path which you have to go. And secondly, you need to be showing to the people around you that you take those things serious, not just by saying that you take them serious, but that you put up objectives and you actually uh, show how you progress towards mm. them. Thank you. Thank you. So it sounds very much like, you know, educating industry, but also the consumers um, and, and uh, uh, informing them about the options that they do have. Uh, sorry. Uh, thanks, Andre. Vincent, uh, what role does strong ethical leadership play in successfully implementing sustainable activities and initiatives within businesses? Thank you indeed for that highly uh, relevant question. Just coming back to what André just uh, mentioned, uh, because I, I believe this is absolutely key. Um, not, not only the lack of consistency in consumer behaviors, which uh, I mean, we're all human beings and prone to failures, uh, but also to progress. Uh, but, but, but the fact that we, uh, you don't command sustainability, you build it um, uh, by, by actions. Uh, I'm, a, uh, I'm a firm believer into uh, um, leading, coming back to, to leadership, leading by, by, um, by, by example. And uh, of course, you always have the cart and the stick, and uh, you need to find that balance way. But in any organization, and possibly more um, uh, precisely within a, 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 a corporation, uh, if you want to go down the sustainability path, you need, it to, you need to take it from uh, the top. Uh, you need, I believe, to have that type of leadership that would then engage with all constituencies, ensure that stakeholders are properly aligned, uh, and that you get the entire uh, institution uh, moving forward. And this is why uh, any uh, sustainability uh, experts, and I'm not one uh, at all, uh, but would claim that with a view to attain these uh, objectives, uh, you need to have uh, the voice at, at, at the top, 
uh, conveying a, a bold uh, a bold message. Uh, now it it always goes back to consi uh, consistency. I mean, um, um, and I, I I share the concerns that have been expressed here. Uh, for most of the corporate actors, they have an eye on their PNL. Um, they're generating jobs, and and they want to ensure that they uh, um, they um, they get some revenues at the end uh, of, at the end of the day. Um, so the, it's it's really a, a change of mindset, I guess, or of paradigm to, to for them to consider, depending, of course, on the type of industries you're active in. But uh, that um, uh, acting sustainably in a sustainable way can gear additional uh, benefits uh, from them. And actually, we have plenty of examples around that, being uh, uh, large firms such as ABB, which has. Um, uh, generated more revenue by uh, uh, cutting uh, carbon emissions or uh, Logitech nearby, who is the inventor of that little mouse uh, that we all have that have reused all the plastics uh, within it and, and making their product not only more affordable, because the, uh, at the end of the value chain, this is what the, 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 the customer is looking at uh, and highly reliable, but also more uh, sustainable. So again, I believe that there is an equation, um, a, a, a difficult one here, uh, that requires some bold steps uh, in terms of leadership, and then making sure that it is being properly executed by uh, the, the, the management and everybody is pulling at the same string rather than uh, shooting itself in, in, in the legs. Thank you. Um, I think it is also important to note that uh, you can have the ethical leadership at the top, but if that isn't pulled through and, and, and your middle level managers ex actually experience all the stress that the ethical leaders have, then that message isn't going to filter through necessarily. And again, if I may on this one, it, it's hard. And I mean, we have a multicultural audience here and this is what makes uh, uh, Geneva uh, unique in terms of uh, uh, its uh, uh, value proposal, if I may put it this way, but I don't think that there is one ethical leader. Uh, it all depends on how the, the, the environment in which we operate uh, uh, evolves. Uh, but what is certain is that if, if you are embodying um, these ethical values at the very top uh, of, of, uh, of a company and make sure that you're, you're an inspiring uh, um, uh, uh, leader that will transpire uh, and, 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 and become the, um, the, the, the rule and hence the benchmark within the organization. And this is absolutely key in my view. Definitely, thank you so much. Then just the last question, uh, doctor, four minutes maximum. <laughs> uh, this morning you spoke about the squirrels uh, eating the nuts um, that was broken. Uh, by someone who had a good intention, but the results were actually not that favorable for the squirrels who all died. Now, uh, being a bit of a cynical person, having been in the field of business ethics for a decade or two, three um, in applied ethics, uh, I always wonder about the intention of businesses, um, whether they are now suddenly involved in ESG, uh, because it looks good on the books and they can put it in the integrated report? Or are they really, do they have a, do they have a good intention? So can you elaborate on the, the intention and how can we judge whether an organization actually has a good intention instead of just a compliance tick box? Yeah, in an ethical construct, we have one bottom line, one direction. The bottom line is no harm. So as long as you don't harm others, you feel free to do whatever you like. Uh, you can run naked in your own home, but not run onto the street. So uh, the, the uh, direction is altruism. So as you can really, because there's no ceiling, you can really do uh, more of the benefits to all stakeholders as much as possible. And so in that regard, uh, we see that uh, the role of business can really take uh, some of the reference from the uh, 
I should say the mutated uh, three golden rules. One is apathetic uh, process, meaning that uh, you feel as others feel. Uh, it's not that uh, something you like, others would necessarily like it, okay? Uh, so therefore, the, normally the singular golden rule is don't do those that you won't be done by. But the other is that you do not have to do those you even like. For example, you're a smoker, you do not have to give cigarettes to others, or you, you are a beef eater, you do not have to force on, upon a vegetarian uh, on this, even if you like it. So, uh, Americans tend to say, oh, you need to have this democracy because, you know, this is good. Uh, but in the end, they mess up. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. So uh, in this way, you know, businesses will have to be most uh, empathetic with multiple stakeholders. Mm. They, uh, because in today it is made possible uh, before without much information, you can only interface with people with your product and price. But right now, customers, the even general public, know the whole process you are making the product, or who is a boss, how many girlfriends he's dating. So therefore, they already vote with their money for ethics. Mm. So this is something that's a big shift of paradigm. Mm. So therefore, in order to make continuously sustainable your money, you must be a good person. You must make your uh, process transparent, and also you make your last one, uh, you know, interface product price more of the accountable. And so this is something that's really shifting. Mm. So it doesn't really revoke my previous statement. People love themselves better, but in order to love yourself better, in order for stakeholders, stockholders love themselves better, they have to love others better. Yeah to gain a sustainable uh, relationship. Thank you very much, Doctor. Okay, do we have some questions, MC? Yes, we have a we have a few questions. So and thank we have you all five so minutes. Much. Yeah, I'm gonna try to like I see. put it into one. Um, so first of all, thank you all for your questions. These are definitely interesting, um, but I, we are short on time. So one of the things I want to bring up is that you t you mentioned a little bit yourself about talking about a top down implementation of ethical practices, ESG initiatives, etc. So in your experiences, what are things that can be implemented at lower level management, whether it's implemented bottom up or at the same time, top and bottom, but what can middle management be doing um, to, to kind of build capacity in that? Um, and the other question would be very much about choice and consumer's choice. So one person had a, had a question about if they're given the option of taking a, now, a nine hour train versus taking a one hour flight, what is the, what is the um, role of businesses? Um, yeah, in that option of choice, uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, Andre. I suppose you are going to go for the choice question. I'm going <laughs> quick on both. Okay, On the thank choice, you. the industry has nothing to do. They have to make clear what are the implications of taking a nine hour train on some questions which are related or one hour plane. At the end, it depends on each one. You might actually like to sit nine hours in the train to uh, get uh, sleeping time and so on, or you might not. You on also the first... won't lose your baggage if you take the train. Yes, <laughs> yes uh, not sure. But anyhow, <laughs> we'll leave that one. The second one, my experience as a, a, a CEO, uh, the CEO has to give a vision where he wants to go with the company. It's a little bit like building a six lane highway. Mm -hmm. So people know where you want to go, but you let them choose the lane they want to take because you want to have their inventivity, their ideas, because you can't do it yourself. But you have to give them clear. I mean, you have to tell them I want to go there because otherwise someone will be there and here. Mm -hmm. So that's what I believe. And the important thing is you have to make this vision livable, feelable. I mean, it's about they have to feel the same thing about this vision as you do. So at the end, a good CEO has to be a great storyteller, a great emphatic 
person who can really get the feeling over because that will give the fuel to the people to actually go this way and actually bring in what they can bring in, which might be many more things than actually the CEO can bring. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else, Jenny? Uh, also, very quickly, I think uh, amongst uh, us here, I'm one of the very few who are in middle management, not CEO. So <laughs> from the first question, I believe, uh, like uh, what Andre shared, the CEO is the one who sets the vision of the company and uh, what they wanted. At middle management, it's a very important role in terms of leading the team, trying to actually, on a daily basis, uh, put the mentality of the importance of sustainability and environmentality into the action, into the work of the, the action. Like, for instance, when our university, in my, in my faculty, when I organize a public lecture or something, in the end, there is always wine and cheese, and they often use uh, paper cups. And then I started getting small glasses, and I said, I don't want to see any paper cups. I don't want to see water bottles. So these are small things that CEOs are not going to do, but these are something that... Uh, Probably, yeah. <laughs> but uh, middle management is the person who's actually there. It's like, okay, take away all the water, all the plastic bottles. I want glass bottles. And then other departments, other faculties started following. Mm. And that the issue with the, the, the one hour plane or nine hour train, they are, I think it's not just about choosing the transportation, it's about other things as well. So, what are other things that would need these nine hours? of train could have other impact mm. compared to the one hour airport. And, uh, and the other thing is that uh, I never check in my baggage. So <laughs> I don't lost my baggage. <laughs> I always travel light and carry them by myself. Yeah, it's Please, it's, it's no. it, uh, very short. Please. Well, you found, a good, uh, you found a good girl, probably nine hours together, you can really create chemistry, but one hour will not be enough. So many other considerations, cost and uh, everything else. So. Depending on who sits next to you in the train. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least in the train, you can move to another um, carriage if you don't like the one uh, sitting close to you. But anyway, in, in 20 seconds, I think this you touched upon a very important uh, topic, uh, which is the role uh, model of, 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 uh, of leadership, which is, key, which is key, but also the fact that you need to engage at all levels of the organization. Mm. And for instance, when I uh, took the role as CEO of the chamber, precisely talking about the bottles, that's a very quick win that I implemented. I said, you stop with the plastic bottle, I'll put the... This won't change the future of our kids, but if all of us are engaging towards these... Uh, um, uh, even modest and humble uh, leverage, I think we'll uh, strive for a better world. Thank you. Absolutely, <laughs> yes, baby steps. Duram, the last word is... Yeah, very quickly. Uh, we uh, really should balance regulation and individual choices and not rely only on the governments to, to, make, to expect them to make the right choices. And uh, to this extent, data is absolutely key and something already actionable. Data in order to give consumers the, the power to decide and uh, to make their choices uh, saying that they uh, they know what they're doing and they know the impact of their uh, individual choices. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all my panel members. I think it's become very clear that, you know, there is a lot to be done, but a lot has already been done. And that uh, perhaps the key in, in all of this is education and awareness creation and the education about what can it mean for you as a consumer, what can it mean for you as um, the business uh, when implementing ESG practices? A big round of applause to...